worry about that. Nope. We're going to give you a little time to eat. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And how are you? Uh, hanging in there, you know. Yeah. Trying to stay above water. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. And how is Jurd? I saw that he called as well, but I wasn't available at the time he called the last time. He's doing well, I guess. Yeah. He had his birthday a few weeks ago. <laughs> a few weeks ago. Right. Yeah. We're all getting old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, let's hope that the uh, electric company allows us to get old because, uh, as you know, I've been... Uh, working on a project of uh, trying to figure out what's going on under this house. Right. And discovered earlier in the year that a number of things had happened in the house over the period of time we've been here and before that are, are linked to charges of electricity from into the house and a magnetic field being created along the side and under the house, uh, which, uh, well, before we uh, two people who had lived in the house um, died here, and uh, they weren't they weren't really old people more in their their sixties, I believe. Uh, one birth here resulted in a mental handicap, and uh, started doing some research on uh, electromagnetism, oh, really? and a guy by the name of Michael Faraday, dating back to the late 1700s, the early 1800s, and I guess he he basically did most of his experiments in about 1833. And I had uh, the cell... Uh, come over, they brought a magnetometer uh-huh. and and checked out uh, the side of the house and said that there was a, uh, a magnetic field that could, in fact, explain the uh, interference with uh, things that occurred inside the house. Uh, including people who lived here for for a long time. Uh, apparently, uh, uh, you can have uh, an interference with the uh, neurons in your body, everything that deals with an electrical kind of circuit within the body, Right. can be interfered with by a magnetic field. If you park a vehicle, as I always had, next to the house, uh, that could interfere with magnetic activity. The starter on the truck, for example, failed uh, to start um, three or four times in the last couple of years, and I had to have the truck towed uh, to Canadian Tire and pay 150 bucks for the towing, and and they would make it work, but not tell me what had in fact happened. And uh-huh. a magnetic field can affect uh, the starter. I'm told the part called metal that's in there. 
but we've had a, a lot of things like the big screen TV has failed. The uh, uh, TV was an old one dating back to the 1990s, uh, but it failed in a strange manner, and half the screen is on, the other half is not on. Uh, We bought a washing machine last year uh, to replace the one that died in the basement, and uh, all of a sudden, uh, it stopped in the middle of uh, an operation with clothes being washed in it. And you c- can't get the thing to start up again. And the door lock, which is operated by a magnet, was locked in position. And... Uh, Never got to be able to start it up again. Finally, pried the door open long enough to get the clothes out. But as soon as I shut it, it locks again, and the machine doesn't work. And the taxi driver then uh, took me to the feed store. Uh, said that uh, happened to him. Um, and he says two bucks off him. Um, so as I'm digging underneath, first of all, I had to get underneath the stairs that lead out of the basement. And four feet down came across an iron rod um, and a wire leading from the iron rod into the concrete wall of the house and on the inside linked to the ground, which, of course, anybody will tell you these days that that's the way it's supposed to be, that uh, you ground everything in the house because you're... you're, um, uh, hydro company uh, sends surcharges, and if the surcharge has no place to get out of the house, it can break some of the uh, the appliances and steel, yeah. you know, that kind of stuff that you have in the house. But these things were happening in the house with the connection on there and it became with the cell a question of what's activating this uh, um, two-way street that they could find with the magnetometer. Not only did you get surcharges going down, but you also got charges coming up through the same system. And it's linked as well to the telephone lines from uh, everything that's apparent, which basically means it's taking the the magnetic field into the house itself. And whoever built this place in 1972... Uh, did a couple of things that are really strange. Uh, One of them is that uh, the house has sections of it that are modeled on Tudor homes back in in, uh, England and Scotland many years ago. Uh, And a Tudor design is also a coding network that if you understand it, you can read uh, different situations that you might have to be dealing with uh, through this tutor design. The other thing is, uh, second thing is the 
the um, addict, unlike all addicts I've ever seen, which are basically one space, is divided with walls to enclose the area under the three rooms that are below it, as if somebody didn't want any interference of things happening from one section to the other. And the ceiling is uh, built out of uh, lightweight uh, material, what do you call that stuff you make, ice coolers with styrofoam. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that wouldn't make any sense. But I'm told that with a magnetic field, it acts as a container. That if uh, one is sitting below it, you're in fact sitting in a magnetic field that has no way of uh, moving away from the space you're in. And I know that over time here, I've I've developed a hamstring or hip problems overnight, you know, uh, Mm. from one day to the next that caused me to have to hobble around for about a month until it kind of went away. Um, And then... um, about four or five years ago, the beginning of a hernia, which has basically caused a, a major problem in my my stomach and scrotum and whatever. Mm. And when you read Faraday uh, and the experiments he was doing, this kind of illness or or um, muscular or neurology problems um, uh, seem to pop up in the people who are working on the experiments, including himself, which includes things like Alzheimer's or senility or um, heart attack or lung problems. Anything that requires muscular activity, like the brain and the heart and the lungs, to make things happen, Mm -hmm. are basically uh, small electric charges that cause them to occur. So I was digging down, so four feet of earth pulled out from under the stairwell to be even with the driveway and then see this rod popping up and then I keep on digging a foot down, two feet down, try to budge the thing and um, it just won't move at all. Um, the, uh, the rod is a steel rod. Um, the... Um, diameter of which would equal, say, a nickel. And it had the connection for the wire on top that leads to the, the power supply in the house, that kind of stuff. You have a lightning rod, too? Connect- hey? Do you have a lightning rod as well? Or- oh, there's no lightning rod. Apparently, they don't put lighting- lightning rods on houses anymore. Mm-hmm. Um and uh, well, they don't even put a rod uh, as a ground anymore. They've replaced it with what they call a plate, which is a kind of a rectangular steel flat plate with a connection for the wire that comes from indoors. Uh, so I got down... Two feet, can't budget, tried to pull it out using uh, the truck when I had the truck. 
<laughs> wouldn't budge. Truck wasn't able to make it move at all. If if it had been just a rod kind of uh, nailed or hammered into the ground, uh, it could have just as well come out in the same way that it went in. And um, of course, you're dealing at this time of the year with water as well and uh, Jennifer came by one day and and said something about you know it's like uh, you're like King Arthur <laughs> trying to pull the sword out of the ground right, sword uh, the stone. <laughs> <laughs> it does doesn't come out, and you've got to find the right person to be able to pull it out. So, You think it might have legs? Every, every day I kept digging, digging down, and uh, I had to remove the concrete slate that had been the top of the stairwell uh, so it wouldn't fall on my head. Um, and uh, uh, notice that Standing in the hole, looking at the rod, it had been put in on an angle. And the angle that it was on would lead to the edge of the house and a space beside the the large concrete uh, uh, kind of patio stone that was the top of the stairwell and, and a kind of a patio on the outside pointing directly at the window that leads to the basement. And the wire, of course, would run from the pole to the house and along the wall and then in at the place where the power supply comes from. So what and about... Didn't you have, um, you know, a couple of years ago, you kept hearing banging underneath your, yeah. your property? The, stuff. Uh, uh, many of the, the people who've come here and have stayed here have made comments that they could hear noises during the night. Megan, whose RV is parked next to the house, also said that she would hear noises. And uh, the cell asked me uh, at one time to go to the smaller room uh, in the middle on the ground floor, not the basement, and see if I could hear what they could hear. And sure enough, there is a, a noise that is... Uh, uh, not always there, but when it is, it's in kind of segments of about uh, 10 seconds, stops for about 5 seconds, starts up for 10 seconds, stops for about 5 seconds. So something what it, down below. What does it sound like exactly? And, uh, it sounds to me like a conveyor. I don't know if that would be, but um, it sounds to me like what I heard uh, in my younger days when I'd go to the beer store. And at the beer store in Canada, um, you don't buy beer at the grocery store. You have to go to a beer store. So all they have is cases of beer with bottles in the back, and then they take the order. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> just talk about <coughs> talk about beer, and I get sore throat. <laughs> they they shove the case on a conveyor, and it comes out next to the cash, and you pick up your beer like that. And the noise That's cool sounds <laughs> like that. It sounds like something on a timer, like a like because like, I I actually live on top of uh, the water boiler for my apartment, and it's it's quiet for about fifteen twenty seconds, and then it kicks on for a minute or two. I guess whenever the temperature drops, it kicks back on. So it reminds, reminds me of that. 
Yeah, in an apartment, it would be an ongoing process almost of on and off, on and off, because there are a lot of people accessing it. In any event, I got down to about uh, four feet, and I could see that I could push the rod, um, four feet of the rod, and it would bend a little bit, uh, and then it would work its way back to its original place, uh, which gave me a hint that I was close to whatever it was that was holding it in place. And I kept on digging, and and the area that I have to dig is is very difficult to work in. It's a there has to be a clay of some particular sort in there that uh, is hard like cement because I'm using a pickaxe, full-size pickaxe, and only chipping it away a little bit at a time and gathering it up, putting it in pails and taking it out. And uh, really hard stuff. But when the water hits it, it granulates, not very deep at any one time, but just the part that's touching the water. And eventually, uh, I understood when I began, it was winter time, and uh, it it never granulated until water touched it and then I could dig about a half an inch uh, when it was granulated, whereas when it wasn't, when there was no water, it was hard as hell. And I have found rocks, um, they remind me of meteors, you know, they're made up of a lot of small rocks all stuck together. And I've found some that you know are about plate size or or larger, like a, a waiter's tray or something like that. Mm-hmm. And I have put them out uh, in front of the garage. And when it rained, the damn things melted. <laughs> <laughs> all all the little granules are there, but they're not made it into a big rock anymore so it's like a meteor going by the sun you know and 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 it breaks down he wrote it in any it. event <laughs> but about a uh oh three weeks ago um i was at uh five feet and i met the guy five feet plus the four feet that was on earth on top. So getting close to about nine feet into the ground, I met the guy who used to date the woman, that young woman that lived here at the time, and they were were next-door neighbors for a while. He doesn't live there anymore, but he comes there. And he said, oh, no, he said, what you have is just, just a uh, a rod for for grounding. He said, um, "I have two on my own house. They're sixteen feet long." Wow! And I said, "Sixteen feet? That's almost two stories. Doesn't make any sense. How could anybody hammer into the ground a sixteen foot rod?" Especially that thing. You'd have to be standing on a balcony <laughs> coming down, and, and I'm not sure that anything you do at the top would have much of an effect on the bottom of it. And also, in it's, any it's, very, event, it's thin, too, right? It's very thin, you said. Yeah. That's not, you can't really... Yeah, for five cents, you know. So, um, I kept on digging, and and I'm at five feet. And it's getting dark, and I'm pulling.
working on it, trying to bend it, see how far it can bend without, you know, finding out what the hell's holding it. And I just can't move the, the thing. So I leave it until the next morning. And then I get down in the hole the next morning and I put my hand on it and I almost fell over with it. It just pulls out of the ground. Huh. And it had it was six feet long. And it just pulled out with my hand. And And the only thing, because it wasn't raining or anything, the only thing I can think of is somebody shut the magnet off. Uh, that would also, by the way, explain King Arthur's. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everybody's trying to pull it out while the magnet's on. You never get it to move, but somebody but, shuts the magnet off and it just comes, slips out. Because it sounded to me like... So the, I'm looking would... at it, mm. and I have this thin rod placed on an angle... 70 degree angle, uh, six foot long, um, and the part that's in the ground is pointed. Yep, had legs. And I start to think about what did I see recently? I saw a program about lightning rods during the French Revolution or something that was on one of the um, museum secrets on TV, I think. And um, they said there are two things that attract uh, lightning. One is something skinny and tall, and two is something pointed. So... And the electrical circuit can be sent into the ground, but it can also be extracted from the ground through a rod that is pointed. That's why they switched from rods to plates. Today, they don't use rods uh, as grounds, I spoke to a number of people in the electrical business in Kempfield and stuff. And I bought one of the plates just so I'd know what it is that they were talking about. So we have a situation here where, uh, and you've probably seen it, uh, unless you keep the sink and toilet very clean with uh, some special cleaning formula, you get yellowing uh, from the water that comes out because unlike city water, country water has all the minerals in it. <laughs> yeah. And... And one of the minerals that's in it is iron. Yep. And that's what would do the discoloration of uh, marbles on sinks and toilets and stuff like that. So you have to use a special cleaning solvent, and it kind of makes it disappear. But I was sitting there thinking about all of this, you know, and... Three or four times, hydro has shut off power in the 14 years I've been here long enough and in the right season for water to rise in the sump pump and beyond, and the pump not being on the water would go onto the floor in the basement. And I remember talking to Megan, who's one of the owners of the house, and saying, unlike in the city, 
this is not a problem because the water is perfectly clear. It's like washing your floor rather than in the city you might get sewage. And that's not a problem when they finally turn the power back on and the sump pump starts working. Well, you just turn on the furnace and the heaters and the blowers and and you let it dry out and you haven't done anything uh, that causes the normal problem of flooding if it was water coming on land from rain on land rather than from water coming up from underground. So never worried about it much until I started thinking, hey, there's iron in the water. We know that because all water has some iron in it, and in the country you're not dealing with any uh, water distillation by the municipality or anything. Uh, There's iron in the water. When it comes into the house and lies six inches deep in the basement uh, and then washes out, you believe that it's all gone. However, any rug that's on the floor that you've dried out and happy to have had the opportunity to wash them. (laughs) You don't realize it, but what in fact you have in that rug is iron. And that would aggravate the effects that come from electromagnetism. Electromagnetism is so bad that over time, over a period of a lifetime, say 60, 70, 80 years, uh, it will create things like Alzheimer's and senility and lung disease and cancers and heart attacks and and mental illness in uh, babies that are born to mothers uh, who've lived in the house for a long time, that kind of stuff. It's so bad that the President of the United States, who's in the process right now of replacing Air Force One, uh, have number of stipulations that must occur uh, before the plane is acceptable as Air Force One, and at the top of the list is it must be shielded from electromagnetism. So... What do you do about a place that underground has what is known as the Canadian Shield? And as a ceiling on your top floor is material designed to contain magnetism to the floors below. And you have the people who can vouch for the fact that they have suffered depression or physical hand manipulation problems. My my fingers often lock in place and I have to pull on them with the other hand to get it loose, and problems with the hip and the muscles in in the legs so that I've spent, at least on three or four occasions, a uh, few months hobbling around 
dragging my leg behind me. Uh, so all of these things seem to be directly related here to the Canadian Shield and enhanced and activated by the activities and wiring systems of Ontario Hydro and Bell Canada. So although the people around us are going to be saved uh, from the loo at the Sioux and any flood, major flood, that would engulf the northern United States and and the uh, western, southwestern end of the province of Ontario uh, with all of the water coming from Lake Superior and the Great Lakes running on land in New York and down all the way to Flushing Meadows. Although we have, because we're not knowledgeable, because it's not part of the education network, uh, have believed that we would be free of that flood and therefore safe based upon the scientific theory called isostasy. The more water runs on land, the more land in another place has to be compensating in its height by moving upwards so that the balance between water under or land under water and land above water is always in balance. So while we have been telling each other that we're safe, the one thing we're not safe from is electromagnetism. Now, you add the fact that when the water runs out of the Great Lakes, it runs past uh, Canada's uh, former nuclear um, collection site um, and releases uh, gases from, from uh, that area called radon. So in the Bible, when they talk about God saying he would never kill everyone on earth with a flood again, it's because God had two more ways of killing them, <laughs> one with gas and one with electromagnetism. And I would suggest to you that the Ark of the Covenant is an electromagnet and that they don't carry it on poles by accident. It's because they've been told they have to say, stay a certain distance away from it if they do that carrying around for a long time. And don't forget that on top it's got something that looks like a pair of wings, which could very well be the gap in the electrical current that, uh, when turned on by the magnet, uh, would give the appearance to those people of a snake jumping across from one to the other. Yeah. So we're learning all kinds of lessons and they don't like me talking about it. And yet, I'll continue to talk about it, even at the expense of my health, if that's what it takes to learn how they have controlled people. you got to remember that 
in the time before the Ice Age, when the first religion was uh, concocted, I guess is the word, the name that we give to that religion is voodoo. And voodoo's principal element was that it could affect people at a distance, i.e. remote control. The best way to control people at a distance physically take a penny, put it on a sheet of paper, put a magnet under the sheet of paper and move it around, you'll see the the remote control is not apparent to those looking down on it, but only to those looking up from underneath the sheet of paper. So electromagnetism is the principal means of direct remote control. Mind you, once you've programmed the person, you can then control them remotely through their head by a system called media. And media includes press, but is not limited to press. It includes religion, education, lawyers, uh, anybody that stands in the middle of a discussion uh, is considered media. An accountant, for example, an architect. So all of these professions are means of remote control but can only be effective for the most part, these uh, radio signals, TV signals, and people doing education and talking uh, can only be of usefulness to the system if prior to birth the genetics of the person is interfered with and task-oriented and oriented in a way where people are commanded unknowingly even to say yes to things they would normally would have said no to. And, of course, in New York, you have the yes network. (laughs) Yep. Linked linked to uh, New York Yankees. Oh, yeah. So all of this is a very interesting process that I'm going through. Unfortunately, the ramifications, such as the truck breaking down, Jennifer's uh, tooth problem, uh, and her hands and feet being stiff, my problems with a hernia and an ulcer, of course, can all be related to the physical aspect of remote control, which is electromagnetism. Hmm. So that might... I have a quick story for you. Maybe this can... I don't know. Um... Like my father was uh was it last week or almost maybe two weeks ago. He was um yeah. you know, he lives in North Carolina now and he um uh, was picking up my sister, my younger sister, the one I went to Japan with, and uh he was picking her up and and then they were driving from the airport, maybe around like ten or eleven at night on this uh, you know, kind of country roads. And he says he sees this, what he thought was like a drone coming down. He said it had three domes and uh, like lights within the domes, right? And it came right down in front of the car while he's going maybe 60 miles an hour and just takes off, right? He thought it was like a government drone or something, you know, whatever it may be. And then about an hour later, he's driving 
Um, and, you know, a car next to him, they're probably doing about 50, 60 miles an hour, a car next to him, cars behind him, and he sees this shadow go in between his car and the car next to him and hit, hit, to the, um, hit his door. And uh, actually it pushed the whole, he has an SUV, uh, GMC, and it just pushed the whole thing over to the right, all four wheels at the same time, um, maybe a little bit off the road. And then he got back on, and then um, so he pulls over a little bit later, and he sees this huge uh, dent in his door. And you know, while he's driving, he noticed like the car next to him was did, nothing was phased, like almost like they didn't see it, like there was nothing. No one had their brakes on, no one reacted to seeing this shadow thing coming over, but he could see it like coming over to his car, and then just hit the side of his door, and um, and he even brought it to the auto body shop, and the guy said he. It's like, what happened? He, he just told the guy that he hit a deer because, you know, how's he going to explain that kind of thing? And um, the guy said, well, there's no blood. <laughs> there's nothing here. And, like, and he, he pulled off the, the molding, the side molding on the door, and he said, look, um, the metal is folded, which instead of just sticking straight in, the metal was folded, and it was like everything was melted. Um, the plastic components were melted in the door. And, and mm-hmm. like if you hit an if you hit an animal, how come it's hitting nothing hits you on the side of the door? You'd hit it in the front, like on the grill. Like if you hit a deer or something, you always hit it in the front first because you're going into it. It's like this was on the side of the door. How did you, something hit you on the side of a door going that fast and move your car over? You know. So. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of things that can be explained if one understands magnetism. Something can get drawn into it. Right. Cloud of uh, iron filings. Uh, Some uh, pressure of of, uh, air. So what do you think would would do that? Well, it, there there are too many options to me now to to <laughs> be certain of any single one of them. Yeah, are they trying to show like they're watching my dad? They're trying to like, or you know what I mean? Are they trying to? It's like some kind of message because before he's he's seen stuff for years and years his whole life like that those kind of you know unexplained kind of things but this is like one of the first times that actually you know proof of you know damage to his vehicle now now it's like he almost got ran up now it's physical you know you can tell these kind of stories to people and they don't believe you but then when it actually now there's a physical thing that happened it's like okay. you know if you have some. Think, think of a a bullet of air shot off by something or sucked up from someplace else um, heading for for metal or whatever mm-hmm. magnetism and compression and all kinds of things could be the end product, but we don't know what we don't know. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. If we don't understand the consequences uh, of magnetism, uh, we can live for 50, 60 years in it, not knowing that some of the events that happened to us um uh, were manufactured didn't just kind of happen like you know i got cancer you know happened right. you know i got a heart attack yeah i'm sure yeah it's the all these <laughs> these things that that they sell pills for right. could be pills that reduce the power of the electrical charge which is being inserted into your body 
and diverts the uh, normal electrical charge that, say, makes your heart pump or makes your lungs draw and exhale air. It wouldn't take much in the way of current. We are basically water yeah. with iron floating through it. Well, that's the thing. They could be giving you, like you're saying, pills or something that could increase or decrease something and make you more con- conducive, and right? Like You, could, you yeah. don't know what. They could be putting it in your water in the city. We don't know what elements they're putting in there, and you're drinking that, and now your body is a huge receptor for all of this. You know, yeah. <laughs> it even comes secondhand through fruit, for example, yeah. through the yeah. juice of of fruits. It, you know, could be in the water, and it's not something that shows up as as a um, chemical which they can dissect, but simply water. Right, and all you have to do media-wise is just ha- run stories for a few months saying how great iron or whatever, take this supplement and ev- everyone's deficient in this, and then they get everybody taking it. <laughs> and then, you know, yeah. <laughs> years later. Yeah. you got to remember that even though the calendars are not the same as they used to be in the past, that... They talk about, generally speaking, much longer lives than exist today. Today's life is managed like a game of golf. Uh You're born as a child and you live for uh, 20 years learning how to learn. (laughs) Yeah. Then you spend 20 years at work learning how to do something. Then you spend 20 years at work managing the people who are learning how to learn to do something. (laughs) And then you retire and you sell your wisdom for the next 20 years and then you die (laughs) oh man (laughs) and if you live longer than 80 years you're on overtime and they gotta let a few people live in order to give the mob that doesn't live long enough uh, hope that they're gonna make it to that stage. Yeah. Where the government pays you instead of you pay the government. Mm-hmm. It's it's a game of golf. You start off on a high place called a T. That's because your body functions from T-cells. T-cells are the repairing network in your body. Mm, And then you play four days of the equivalent of 20 years of living. Everything looks good at the beginning. But then you see all the impediments to your advancing are the trees that border the fairway and the bunkers and and the holes that contain flowing water going through it so that you have to kind of tippy-toe around all of this stuff Keep going down the middle, do what you're told to do, or you're going to be in trouble. Then you come back the second day and you've seen how it works a bit and you try to keep down the middle and and play par. <laughs> and 
you repeat the process four times, which is the equivalent of 80 years living on Earth. And each one has a different meaning and a different task for you during that period in time. And and when you're done, you're like a snowman. You lasted through the winter of your discontent. And when you start feeling good again, because the sun come out, you melt away and die. <laughs> in a, in a they, <laughs> they needed to have the numbers of people on the planet for a fixed period of time so that they could operate a laboratory and learn everything that needed to be learned about war, pestilence, famine, and disease for the purpose of remote control. Because they stayed hidden in the pre-Ice Age state of having found security going down a cone volcano and living in the Moho discontinuity using robots called human beings to do their duty. And those robots basically come out of a bottle like genies and are put on the planet and then they run all these experiments around them and get get them to show how war affects a human being. Those who win, those who lose, and the lives of the people before it, the lives of people after it, all these are lessons to be learned along with famine, pestilence, and disease. And once they have all of the information they need from the number of people who have born, been born and died and added to that the people who are still alive today, added to that uh, is the lesson learned by the masses. Not only do you find out what happens to the person who went to war, but you find out what happens to the person who didn't go to war, but met people who went to war and see how they think as opposed to how you think. And that's done by immigration, moving people around after war is a normal way of infesting people who haven't been to war and haven't learned the lessons directly. The total number they needed on the planet appears to be 14 to 16 billion, half of which lived and died, half of which are now present on the surface of the earth. And when it's when all the lessons are learned, then like snowman you must melt away. So we are at the period now where all the people that live on the planet, even your worst enemies, even the genetically engineered version that has replaced the people who were here at the beginning, all have to be removed so that they can now start the process of building the 
human robot they need for the exploration of the outer space. And that means soon. Yeah. Soon we must all die so that our controllers can say, okay, that's it. Give us a couple of millennia where the earth lies fallow, and then we'll come out and plant the new version of human beings so that there will be the pre-ice age type, the post-ice age type, and the new person. So we are in that period of, in numerology, you say males are eight, uh, women are nine, or women are nine, and women are tens. So get rid of all three and start over again with a triune hermaphrodite. A female with a male content and a technology content all put together into one person so that it can travel by itself and establish a base on every rock up there, the billions of rocks in the Oort cloud to begin the process, and then further out into the universe. Creation, on the other hand, said, that's not my plan for the universe, and therefore... I'm going to gather up all of the people who are not responsible for all the injustice that occurs. And it won't be a big crowd, but it will contain the leadership that's needed for the future. And I'll attach them to the people who lived and died the seven to 8 billion who lived and died but had no responsibility in making the mess they're in. And together, I'll take them out of this universe through the back door and put them at a place where they can continue progressing without the interference of the genetically engineered task-oriented dummies that were created by the blue and gray nuns. <laughs> yeah. I know. The blue <laughs> nuns, by the way, moved out of Germany and went to Jerusalem during the Crusades and never left. They come from an area around the Golan Heights today to run Jerusalem. But in the Golan Heights area of Syria, they did all the genetic engineering that was required for Europe. Yeah. So, you think you'll do any more... Uh posts or anything to any more what sorry any, I didn't hear. any more posts or something that at the appropriate time and hopefully when a sufficient number of people have uh, joined to lead this uh, fray uh, from what I understand, there can be as many as 60 who come forward, 30 who are honest about it, 
30 who are in it for personal gain, and they kind of disappear over time. Uh, but 13 bring with them the qualities necessary to lead a certain task in the future. And 17 will be uh, like the engineers are to architects. Uh, The architects are the leaders who see the future by understanding the past. The uh, 13 lead the way with knowledge, but 17 carry out the projects that the philosophers, the thinkers, have put forward. And seven to eight billion people would then be available from the people who've lived and died and had no link to causing the problems in the past. all have to meet on the farm, I guess, huh? That's Somewhere. where it all begins. That's where it all begins. It's got to start soon. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, the farm is 34.2 acres, which I am told is exactly the same size as the complex of the temple in Jerusalem. <laughs> By coincidence, of course. Yeah. And is uh, shaped like a gun. And the first um, emperor of China was called Gun. And his son succeeded in all that he failed. And his son's name was You. So you are it. <laughs> you are it. Yep. Time's ticking, though, you know? <laughs> yeah. If you can think of someone that has a vehicle, especially a truck, and wants to spend some time on the farm, that would be helpful. Where I live, not too many people have trucks. <laughs> yeah. As a matter of fact, um, Jennifer's car, Honda, uh, which she is not allowed to use uh, in Canada as a refugee, uh, would be available for a trade-in. If somebody has a truck, they would rather trade for a Honda uh, we have one of those. But the farm needs a truck. Have you looked on uh, any um, circulars to see, you know, what a used truck is going for now? Like a, what you're looking for? Um, the range would be about the same value as the car. Uh, which has been evaluated at ten to twelve thousand uh, dollars, we would be ready to trade it in on a truck that has a value of uh, 
seven to twelve thousand dollar range. So if you come across any anybody that might be interested, let them what, know. What's the car? Is, um, what, what is, how much does she have left on that car? Loan wise, it's, it's paid off. There's it's no paid off. no. Uh, so you could just trade it no in. that it was paid off in her last year in Ogdensburg. The the final payment I think was uh twelve hundred dollars or something like that. And that was paid, so it's owned outright. And you could just donated. trade it in, right? Can't you just trade it they they like the institute. Could you trade it in for say like a truck that's eight thousand and then you guys can get or sell it for I, would, <laughs> I would uh rather that it be done here than through a dealership. Well I mean say say you have a private sale, like you put it on in the paper or something, you know, listed for yeah. nine or ten and then you get the cash and you could buy something that you can well, use. There, there's always technicalities when one came in as a uh, uh, refugee, and I don't want to complicate the issue of uh, selling and then having money, and and she's not supposed to work or you know not supposed to be a part of the Canadian economy. That's why I keep thinking the better way would be uh, an exchange. But she can gift it to you or the uh, or the institution. She has, she has gifted it to the institute. <coughs> so it would be the institute trading it for a truck. But, I mean, essentially, like, what you're asking me is the same as if you found a private seller, you know, some kid who wants a Honda up in, up by you. Yeah. And he has a truck on the, you know, that they could just trade you. Yeah. See, sometimes, um, say, a male has a truck and dies, and the woman is left alone. And she would rather have a small car than a truck. That's basically, I think, where this thing will develop. Both get a good deal and get what they're looking for. You need one of those weekly circulars (laughs) to check for that. Yeah. Another option would be event, Danny. I'm gonna to have to go because I gotta go close up the farm there before it gets dark. Okay. All right. And thank you for your assistance and your help, and and you're welcome to come anytime. Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> help whenever I can, or as long and as say I say hi to Jerd. <laughs> I will. All right. Say hi to Jenny. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Bye for now. Right. Bye. You too.